Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us, both in the room and online. I'm Stuart Wildman. I'm the chair of the History of Nursing Forum here at the uh, RCN. We aim to support and promote general interest research and education in the history of nursing, midwifery, and health visiting. We're here today for the Royal College of Nursing's annual History of Nursing Lecture. The RCN is the professional body of main trade union for nursing in the UK. We're pleased to have people here in the building and also online from around the world. I'm going to just do some housekeeping uh, <clears throat> notes first before I introduce Helen. Uh, for those, for those, those of us who are in the building, there are no fire, planned fire alarm tests, so if the alarm does sound, please exit the building through the nearest fire exit, which is on the right. The muster point is in Cavendish Square. Anybody who wants a toilet, these are through the doors to your left and down one flight of stairs, or there are disabled toilets at the back of the room. For people who are tuning in online, please note attendees will not be able to speak or contribute during the stream. If you're having trouble with, with the Zoom connection, try leaving the event and click, clicking back in to rejoin. If you have any questions, comments or problems with your connection during the talk, post them in the chat and staff from the library <coughs> will be able to check and help you. Please remember that the chat is a public forum and everyone can see your comments. There will be opportunity to, after the talk to ask questions by using the question and answer function. There are also automated closed captions on the online event, which can enable, can, you can enable or hide by using the CC button. I think that's, that's all the, the business bit out of the way. Get onto the, the actual pl pleasure of all this now so i'm really pleased to welcome you to this event and to welcome helen rapaport our speaker for tonight helen is a sunday times and new york times best-selling author and historian specializing in the period 1837 to 1918 in late imperial and revolutionary russia and victorian britain she has written 16 books and she tells me the 17th is on its way covering her broad range of historical knowledge and is a regular contributor to history and documentary program, programs for TV and radio. As a historical consultant, she most recently worked on the first two series of the ITV drama, Victoria. As a linguist with a degree in Russian special studies, she has also worked for many years as a literal translator in the theater, specializing in the plays of Anton Chekhov. In 2016, Helen was awarded an honorary D-Lit by her old alma mater, Leeds University, for her services to history. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming Helen to give our 2023 annual lecture. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's come tonight and greetings to everyone watching online, wherever you are. I come to you not as a medical person or even a scientist. I've written Mary's story and this particular lecture from the point of view of history and what I understand of Mary's tradition of doctoring and nursing. So please bear in mind, I'm not a medical specialist in any way, shape or form. When Mary Seacole was born in 1805, the tradition of Jamaican nursing and use of herbal treatments based on the island's indigenous plants and trees was already really well established. Its practitioners were known as doctresses. Now, there are no images of doctresses, sadly. The nearest I could find was this image of women of color painted around the turn of the 18th, 19th century. And, and the, the style of dress is similar to probably how they would have dressed. Um, the title of doctress comes specifically from plantation system. Doctresses were also known as hothouse nurses 
because they first appeared on plantations um, in, the, in the hospitals on the actual plantations. They were often women of color who once they gained their freedom, um, went into Port Royal or Kingston, here's Port Royal, very typically uh, of the period, a bit later in the century, and they would run lodging houses where they could also um, operate as doctresses, nurses, and look after the many sick um, military and naval people coming and going on the West India Station. Their services were really uh, genuinely, particularly sought by, by, the white, by the white military and also the planters too. And Mary had a very famous precursor. And I think it's important not to overlook her because Mary didn't spring out of nothing. A precursor was called Cuba Cornwallis, who was a respected lodging housekeeper and nurse in Port Royal, whose premises, much like Mary later in Kingston, operated as a kind of, not just a lodging house, but also a sort of convalescent home for the sick. Now, there's, as I say, no picture of Cuba, but I love this wonderful watercolour of Lady Mariah Nugent's nurse and midwife. We don't even know her name, but Lady, Lady Nugent was the American wife of the governor of Jamaica in the 1800s. And again, this image um, to me conveys something of what the doctresses and nurses in Jamaica in that period would have looked like. Cuba's name, of course, is a traditional African Obeya one and may have originally, she may have originally been enslaved and brought from Africa, we just don't know, but she learned her skills like all the other doctresses on the plantations and after being granted her freedom moved into um, Port Royal where she looked after a Captain William Cornwallis, who probably at some point had owned her as his own enslaved woman and set her up in business. And just as Mary did later, Cuba made all her own treatments and traditional germ Jamaican herbal remedies, which she used to nurse the many patients, white patients from the Navy, especially who were plagued by fevers and fluxes, as they called them, dysentery, cholera, yellow fever was absolutely rife amongst the white people in Jamaica at the time. And of course, Cuba had a very, very famous patient, Lord Nelson, only of course he wasn't a Lord then, he was just young Nelson in the Navy, aged 22, who in 1780, when he was out in the West Indies, fell very sick, probably with dysentery and was carried on shore and taken totally prostrate and almost dying to Cuba's lodging house. And it was thanks to her nursing that she recovered. And Nelson wasn't the only famous patient, actually. A young midshipman, Duke of Clarence, who later became King William IV, was also nursed by Cuba Cornwallis when he too succumbed to fever in the West Indies. And so grateful was King William's wife, Queen Adelaide, later that she sent Cuba a beautiful gown as a gift of thanks. And Cuba absolutely refused to wear it. She was so thrilled to be given it and she saved it to be buried in. <laughs> so the nursing connection, as I said, um, to Nelson and to royalty is not unique to Mary Seacole. But why was she called a doctress? Because the term, as I've said, was traditionally associated with women of color and black women who nursed in the hot house or the sick house system on sugar estates, very much like this one, which is the Holland estate in St. Thomas in the East in Jamaica. Many, many enslaved people brought to, to Jamaica from Africa could not tolerate the appalling, appalling humid heat of the West Indies. They were used to the dry heat of Africa and they succumbed in absolutely huge numbers to disease and sickness in, in, and also being overworked on the plantations. And the white authorities to deal with this recommended that the owners should set up what they called these hot houses or sick houses on every plantation. And it's very, very hard to find any evidence of these now 
uh, much of this history has been lost. But there is this very rare survival of the Orange Valley Slave Hospital, as it was called, in Trelawney, and the county of Cornwall in Jamaica was built in the late 1790s. Now, it's a pretty grim and forbidding looking place. And in fact, the slave hospitals, as they were called in the 1770s, later the name was changed to Negro hospitals after emancipation, were overseen usually by a white doctor, but the rest of the nurses, the midwives who worked there, um, the attendants were all, all people of color and black people on the plantation. And the doctress was usually the chief woman in charge of this team of nurses and, uh, and uh, midwives. And these places were intentionally bleak, as you can see. They were enclosed, iron bars on the windows, strong padlock doors. They were virtual prisoners. And of course, the nurses and doctresses looking after the patients inside were effectively turnkeys. They had to keep the people locked up so they didn't take infection elsewhere. In fact, they were so um, confined that the rebellion, more rebellious people inside them were actually padlocks, you know, locked up down in the, in the basement of the buildings. And um, they were even not allowed bedding to discourage them from, from feigning sickness in order to get off laboring in the sugar plantations. There were many, many diseases that affected the enslaved people from Africa in that, in that period. It was a terrible time of suffering. There was worms, the warmth and the humidity, inflammatory fevers, diarrhea, tetanus, dropsy, cholera morbus, hepatitis, leprosy, and the worst and most frightening thing of all was yours, which was a chronic and very virulent bacterial skin infection um, characterized by lumps and ulcers. And so, so infectious was it that the yours patients often were segregated in a separate hot house. Now, Mary never mentions dealing with yours patients, but she certainly would have dealt with all the others. I searched very, very hard when I was researching Mary's life for any evidence, any actual written naming of doctresses. And after much scouring, I found one here, Elizabeth Hamilton. This is on a list of slaves, enslaved people on a plantation in the Buff Bay estate. And there's, there she is, Elizabeth Hamilton, hospital doctress and the poor woman had lost a leg. But that's the only written evidence, I mean, I, I know they existed, but actually to find a doctress's name listed on, on a list of enslaved people is very, very rare. Well, after the abolition of slavery in 1807, and particularly after emancipation in 1834, the term doctress came to be more generally applied to free Jamaican women of color who practiced holistic native methods. But the problem, as I said, for me as a historian and any historian trying to chase this down is there's just nothing said about their methods. I couldn't find any accounts of from doctresses or by doctresses of their actual methods because they learned their skills orally. They learned their skills, many of them like Mary with her mother watching her mother prepare her own medical treatments they learned them by doing by doing it and so things were handed down from mother to daughter and onwards and we so we have this perennial problem of lack of sources now we don't know how mary's mother rebecca learned her own skills as i've said probably on a plantation and then she was given her freedom she came into kingston and set up her own lodging house business, nursing the sick and, you know, cooking hot dinners. And Mary very much followed in that tradition. And she would watch her mother making up all her concoctions. But to be truthful, in this period, most Jamaican women of color had their own little recipes and for homemade teas and tonics and purges for all kinds of complaints. I mean, they could go out the front door and pick the herbs and the and the plants that they needed to make the holistic medicine because obviously access to a doctor was rare and many couldn't even afford to pay doctors so their own holistic remedies were what they largely relied on 
One of the most interesting things in researching Mary's story was finding at least one account of all the extraordinary plants in Jamaica that were drawn upon, because the pharmacopoeia is astonishingly rich. And they were gathered together in 1801 by a British doctor called Thomas Dancer in this wonderful book. It's called Medical Assistant or the Jamaican Practice of Physic. I urge you, go and look at it. It's online on Google, Google Book Search. It's absolutely fascinating. And it contains this wealth of fascinating herbal treatments, such as yellow thistle for fluxes and bellyache, velvet leaf and cotton tree for coughs and consumption, spikenard and trumpet tree for dropsy, prickly yellow wood for convulsions, Barbados pride for female obstructions, and hog gum for female weakness. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Halbert weed for indigestion, stinking weed for itch, and parrot weed for warts. I mean, it just goes on and on. Glorious, glorious list of, of weird and wonderful plants. But even Dancer had to admit that many of them were totally unknown to him. And another English botanist, William Jowett Tipford, who made a study a bit later of the plants in Jamaica and North and South America, said something very interesting. He said in 1811, this is, that he was assisted in identifying the names and uses ascribed to certain plants by a Negro doctress whose fame was great in the Red Hills and whose knowledge in the opinion of the Negroes, and I quote, was far superior to that of the physicians. And it, it, I found this several times going back, comments made about the efficacy of the, and the skills of the Jamaican doctresses and herbalists were mentioned by white doctors, white botanists, and just completely overlooked. So what should we call Mary? She seems to have employed in her practice a mix of African Jamaican and Western allopathic medicine. And reading her memoir, you get a sense of someone with a combination, who was a kind of combination, multi-skilled nurse, doctress, definitely a good midwife, a herbalist, and even a pharmacist, effectively a good pharmacist. Indeed, recently, there's been, as many of you will know, a degree of controversy over whether Mary could, should really be called a nurse in our sense of the word. Well, of course, we all know that nurses training hadn't yet officially been established, not in the sense of the Nightingale trained nurses until in the 80s, until 1860s. So when I was researching the biography, I had a conversation with a Jamaican academic and I asked him about this and he said he, he was absolutely emphatic that in the Jamaican tradition, Mary was not a nurse. She was first and foremost a doctress and with a direct link back to her African roots, unconscious African roots, obviously, and importantly, the tradition of a bear, which uh, this uh, academic described as a kind of benign witch doctrine. Well, it wasn't, you know, witch doctrine in the evil way, but benign. Um, so the Jamaican doctresses also incorporated aspects of Arawak, which is the native Taino Indians, in Jamaica, aspects of their medicine as well. And all in all, many of these treatments proved to be much more effective than what the Western white allopathic doctors had to offer. Another thing that was said to me quite emphatically by a trained pharmacist and scientist was that in his estimation, Mary definitely had the equivalent skills of a pharmacist then. So the virtues of the West Indian holistic treatments and the skills of the doctresses were persistently undervalued by white doctors who had no knowledge of the wide range of all these wonderful medicinal herbs. And I was again interested to discover an 1880s American practitioner who noted how in the West Indies, a Creole nurse or irregular as he called her, um, was often called in when allopathic medicine failed and how 
by the suspension of the mercurials, iodines and iodides and irritants, and the substitution of a few simples, the patient recovered. In her memoir, we know that Mary resisted the use of opiates and mercury-based medicines, and she certainly never, ever resorted to bleeding patients. But what is very interesting about her story is that she was very eager to learn new techniques in diagnosis. So whenever she had white doctors staying at her lodging house in Kingston, Kingston, she always wanted them to explain new methodologies to her in order to enhance her own knowledge of anatomy, physiology, pathology, and, and certainly some of the more enlightened doctors when they were in Jamaica, and especially later in Crimea, learned from Mary the value and efficacy of her native holistic remedies. So we come on to what did Mary use in her practice? Well, this is difficult because she, does, she says a little in the memoir, but again, her major use in Jamaica and of all, and this would have been characteristic of all the doctresses, would have been the chippings and bark of logwood and mahogany, which grew in absolute profusion in, in the West Indies, but particularly Jamaica. And these were chipped and ground and pulverized to make astringent drinks for people with enteric um, fevers of one kind and another. Thomas Dancer in his book made, that I previously mentioned certainly talks of mahogany and logwood being turned into astringent drinks. They'd be boiled in water with cinnamon, sweetened with guava jelly or sometimes port wine. So Mary, before she even went to Crimea, was well known in, in Kingston um, as a practitioner. And this is the Kingston that she was operating in at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, in 1830, there were about 300 Western doctors in Jamaica, and there were surgeons with the army and navy and physicians for the civilian population. But there were also many, many unofficial women of color who worked as nurses and especially as midwives, many of them, including Mary, delivered the babies of the wives of the military and the naval um, personnel out there. And these lodging houses that many of them stayed in because they didn't like the rather Spartan army barracks, uh, officers were allowed to stay downtown in Kingston, often became nursing homes, as I've said, when they got sick. So the doctresses not only ran the lodging houses, they nursed. Uh, it's very hard to be sure quite what Mary's nurse um, lodging house will look like because it's e even now I can't totally prove where it was, but it was probably like Mrs. Edwards on the left. The one on the right is one of the most famous lodging houses in Kingston, Daytree Hall, but it would not have been as grand as that. Before Mary even got to Crimea, she nursed through two major epidemics and again, this is what it frustrates me in Mary's story. She had all these skills of nursing enteric disease, hands on nursing of enteric disease, which later, of course, was exactly what was killing the troops in droves in Crimea and in Varna before they even went. There was a major epidemic of cholera in Kingston in 1850 to 1851, in which up to 50,000 people died. 5,000 alone in Kingston. The disease was rife because of the foul water and open sewers, bad, very bad sanitation. And the army was very badly hit up at Up Park Camp. This was their big base just up out of Kingston. And Mary tells us she was enlisted by the army to head a team of nurses during that cholera epidemic. But then she frustrates us by telling us nothing more. And I searched and searched and searched, and I cannot find any official military account of the role she played. Um, it's a shame, but the standard allopathic response to cholera in 1850 was pretty limited. Much of it was proprietary bottles of Batley's sedative solution or homey remedies like this one, you know, drops of laudium, laudanum, drops of ether in a solution and fed 
at regular intervals. Now, I don't know how lethal that looks, but anyway, that was pretty much the standard treatment for cholera. The other standby, of course, was calomel, a mercury-based preparation, which was designed to purge the system. And again, mixed with sugar and given in repeated doses to try and sedate the, pa pa the patient. Well, after she'd nursed in that epidemic, Mary, being the bold and adventurous soul she was, went to Panama. And she went, you know, straight into the middle of another terrible, pan uh, terrible, not pandemic, epidemic. Panama in 1851 to three, the two years she was there, was an absolute death trap. It, the climate was horrendous, and it was all very much virgin territory. There were laborers going over from the West Indies to build the Isthmus Railway across the narrowest bit. And they were falling sick with cholera and all kinds of horrible, horrible enteric diseases. And Mary, very the minute she got there, found herself called upon to deal with cholera epidemics. But the, the interesting claim to fame she later gained while there was the American gold prospectors were all cutting across the Isthmus of Panama to get make the shortcut to get around to the California gold fields. Um, heard about her her reputation and she became known to them as the yellow woman with the cholera medicine and that's how they referred to her and of course she got called on time and time again uh, to deal with people with cholera but far far worse was yellow fever yellow fever in, in panama was horrendous it really was a truly terrifying disease came on um, very rapidly with an intense intense chill then terrible feverishness headache and of course that characteristic by which it became known the vomito negro as the spanish called it the the black vomit which was triggered by bleeding in the mouth through the nose and the eyes and the gastrointestinal tract and it was a horrifying and frightening disease Mary nursed through the cholera epidemic and she applied the same principles that she did in all her nursing in treating cholera patients as well. She trusted to her own simple remedies. And first of all, she one of the first things she did in Panama was fling open all the doors and insist on good ventilation, cleanliness, giving patients plenty of fluids, keeping them warm with her massage which she was very very good at and in general whenever she could applying her rather famous mustard plasters she swore by her mustard plasters well the one on the right's a proprietary one from later in the century but basically she would take brassica nigra the mustard seed grind it to powder in her pestle and mortar and make it into a paste with water and vinegar. It was a standard ingredient as a, a, a ruby patient with, in any pharmacy. And she would keep the body warm by making poultices and plasters of, of ground up mustard seed, massaging it into the pit of the cholera patient's stomach because this would swell and harden as the disease progressed. She also massaged the soles of the feet to relieve cramps and stiffness and the neck and the spine. She had this thing about keeping the patient warm about the heart, as she put it. And she became a very skillful masseuse, actually. So after spending a couple of years in Panama, Mary was back in Jamaica in 1853 when she was called upon yet again by the British Army to nurse through another devastating outbreak, this time yellow fever in Jamaica. And many of the patients were actually officers and their wives, because the poor wives arriving in Jamaica, they'd no sooner got off the boat and they were d falling sick and dying of yellow fever. It was horrible. And she, Mary tells us that her lodging house was full of sufferers, of officers, their wives, and their children and it was terrible suffering that she said she never ever wished to have to see again it was more difficult to bear than any i had previously borne a part in she said 
So taking into account all this experience Mary had, it's all the more baffling and infuriating that the British authorities did not eagerly recruit her uh, and also a couple of other West Indian nurses that we certainly know applied to, for the Nightingale contingent when the Crimean War broke out because they had precisely the skills from nursery, nursing uh, enteric disease, particularly dysentery, which was rife as well, that was felling the troops out in, the mid, out in around the Black Sea. And it's very, very interesting to see that at least, well, more than one, I found two or three, um, one particular army doctor back in 1846, this man, William Ferguson, had written in his Notes and Recollections, which was published just before he died, sadly, lauding the skills of the black nurses in the West Indies because he had been an army doctor out in the West Indies and had himself fallen sick with yellow fever there and been nursed by them, as too had Sir John Hall, head of the army medical services during the, during the Crimean War, which is why I think in fact, I'm convinced that's why he gave Mary his official rubber stamp to operate in Crimea, because he had recovered from yellow fever in the West Indies, like William Ferguson. Uh, in his book, it's really interesting, he's quite categorical about the wonderful skills of the black nurses who looked after him when he was very sick. And it's also quite amusing because they told him, don't go near the British white doctors because they kill all their patients, they were telling him. And they insisted he only take the medicines that they gave him. And in conclusion, he said that they were the best sick nurses in the world. Nothing can exceed their vigilance and tenderness. And it is to be regretted that they should not always succeed in obtaining the place that they are so well calculated to fill. And that's the missed opportunity of the British Army authorities in Crimea by not taking on these wonderful women. It's a pretty prophetic statement because that's what happened to Mary. She got turned down by the authorities. And she. I, there's no time, I'm afraid, in this lecture for me to explain how she went through all that palaver and got herself to Crimea. But she did eventually, having volunteered to nurse, get herself by her own, um, under her own steam and her, at her own expense out to Crimea. And I want to start by laying one or two erroneous claims about Mary to rest here. First and foremost, Mary Seacolt did not build a hospital in the Crimea. She did not run a hospital in Crimea. She did not have patients staying with her at her British hotel. Well, it wasn't a hotel, it was a bit of a mishmash, but anyway. So that is a myth that really, really needs to be buried. And I'm sorry to see it's still in a lot of key stage literature. Nor did she race around the battlefields like some kind of energetic Victorian paramedic dragging wounded men off the scene of the battle. First of all, because if you look here, you'll see that all the battles took place the previous autumn before she even got there. She didn't get there till March the following year. So Mary was not right up at the front lines. She was about four and a half miles below the front lines at a place called Spring Hill. And she gave it that name on here is her wonderful establishment. Uh, and as you can see, it was a kind of general store, come canteen, come unofficial officers club where a bit, quite a fair bit of late night drinking went on. Um, but beyond the actual storehouse, she had a kind of um, come as you like sort of drop in clinic where any soldier who was ill or needed a wound stitched or a bullet, bullet extracted, who wanted some of her to be dosed up with her, her um, uh, one, one of her stringent drinks for dysentery, they would turn up and she would not turn anyone away. So she offered this kind of ad hoc service up at Spring Hill. Now here it is, and one interesting thing again, which confirms she did not run her own hospital. 
Here, where Ernest is, is Spring Hill, where she set up her ramshackle establishment of many corrugated iron and bits of flotsam and jetsam. She called it because there was a freshwater spring right nearby. And in fact, her business partner, Thomas Day, chose the location because of the freshwater spring. Uh, where Mary mainly went and visited hospital patients as such, in fact, was at the land transport camp here. These little black squares are where all their field hospital tents were. And the men of the land transport in particular suffered terribly um, a high rate of disease, particular cholera at the time. They were worked very hard in all weathers, you know, building the railroad, maintaining the roads, doing a lot of serious, heavy kind of navvy work. And so that's where she went to offer her comforts, to take magazines, to sit and chat. This is not Mary's hospital. It's the interior of one of the land transport um, host field hospitals across the way from her. So what did Mary take with her to the Crimea in terms of her nursing work? Well, again, she doesn't tell us, unfortunately, so I can only kind of guess, but she might have well have had this kind of um, medical traveling case. This is actually a homeopath's traveling case. Now, of course, Mary was not a homeopath, uh, and many people sometimes muddle that, but she would have had her basics, what she could get hold of with her in some kind of um, traveling case. But she said that, you know, she insisted out in Crimea, it was the same principle that guided her as before, the simplest remedies were perhaps the be best. And she soundly rejected the use of particularly opium, which was very heavily relied on by the army doctors at the time. Uh, she felt that it, its effect is to incapacitate the system from making any exertion, and it lulls the patient into a sleep, which is often the sleep of death. But of course, in Crimea, the only real allopathic drugs available were the good old mother's little helper standbys, you know, calomel and opium, laudanum, and all the variants of those. And at times, Mary had did use calomel. She, she, but she avoided opium like the plague. She really did reject the use of opium. Uh, and she did say that if calomel was taken in moderation. Uh, you know, it, it could help at times, but she preferred always to use her, what she called her mustard emetics, warm fomentations, mustard plasters on the stomach and the back, and keeping her patients warm. She would sit for hours massaging their extremities, their hands, their feet, keeping them warm, making sure that uh, as they were recovering, she was very insistent on good invalid food to get their strength back up. And there's some wonderful accounts of Mary in the Crimea of making up her medicinal drinks and offering them free to all and any who came and requested her help. And um, because it was enteric disease really was rife among the tra land transport men. There, there was 34% death rate from cholera in Crimea in the summer of 1855 among those men. And what was this magic ingredient that she used that they all swore by? It went all round the Crimea that go to Mrs. Seacole's for a dose of jollop for your diarrhea or whatever. And it was pomegranates that she used because of course, one has to remember in Crimea, she couldn't get logwood and mahogany. She was mm, thousands of miles from Jamaica. She had to improvise with what was available around Asia Minor. Well, I've been to Asia Minor, I've been to the Black Sea, and pomegranates are everywhere. So she boiled up the skins and the juice from pomegranates and made her astringent drink. She put in cinnamon as well. Normally, she would have added guava jelly, but I don't know that she could have got guavas over there so she probably sweetened it with port wine or sugar and this recipe um was much much sought after by the army and it's it's good to note too that of course with all her remedies they were boiled the water was boiled which made it a lot 
greatly reduce the infection risk, obviously. And this magical <laughs> pomegranate recipe was much noted by the army doctors. And just one or two testimonials here. General Sir Richard Dennis Kelly talked of, at the time of the cholera, Mary used to prescribe pomegranate juice, which was an almost never failing specific. The Reverend Kelson Stoffert said, she had the secret recipe for cholera and dysentery and liberally, liberally dispensed it alike to those who could pay and those who could not. The war correspondent of the morning advertiser, her powders for the latter epidemic are now so renowned that she's constantly beset with applications and it must be stated to her honor that she makes no charge. And I could go on and on. After the Crimean War, Mary came back to England for a while and enjoyed her 15 minutes of fame. Well, a bit longer than that, but she was a household name. There's no doubt about it. And then for a while went back to Panama. And then we have the last and perhaps the most intriguing part of her medical story, I guess. And that is when she came back to England in 1866, there was a massive cholera epidemic going on in London. And Mary, being Mary, wanted to do her bit, wanted to help. It was the fourth major cholera epidemic in London in 35 years. And the East End in particular was very, very badly hit in the areas of Poplar and Bow. And here's an interesting thing. When I was searching and searching and searching for evidence of Mary doing, take, trying to take some active role, and help in the epidemic at the time, I found a very precious mention of her in the Lancet even. For some few weeks past, she has been making herself useful in the East End of London by distributing her cholera mixture among the patients, which had been found of great service. But what was the mixture she was offering? Was it her uh, boiled up pomegranate astringent drinks or some kind of tincture that, or, or something that could be bottled on a smaller scale? Now, this is a very a typical cholera tincture recipe of the time. And Mary's would have been something similar to that. You know, obviously in Jamaica, she would have used logwood or mahogany chippings. So, I looked very hard and eventually, I just was so thrilled. I found an article in the Colonial Standard in 1866 entitled, Our Old Friend Mrs. Seacole, in which Mary gave her dosages. Okay, so we had the dosages, you know, 30 drops of this, 20 drops of that in water. Um, but of course she didn't say what the tincture was. We still didn't know the precise ingredients, but for cholera, for example, she'd say, take 40 drops in a tablespoonful of water every two or three or four hours, according to the intensity of the disease. I won't read it all because there isn't time. But what really was to me one of the best finds, I have to say, um, was I found these. She actually advertised her preventive and curative medicines for cholera, diarrhea, and dysentery. And that was where she was living at Upper Barclay Street for quite a while in the 60s. And she, I found these adverts in quite a few places for Mrs. Seacole specific. Doesn't it sound wonderful? Um, but of course, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly what was in that. But another intriguing thing was I think in that period of the 1860s, after she came back with the, after the cholera epidemic, she was operating privately because, of course, she couldn't work her, as a practitioner. She wouldn't have been allowed to as a woman, certainly not even as a black woman. So she was, I think, relying on her all her old friends and patrons from Crimea who'd known her and knew how good her, her nursing and treatments had been there and had a sort of clientele. Um, on tap, because here's another interesting piece of evidence about Mary. Look here, this is a detail from this long list of donors to the big cholera relief fund. Mrs. Seacole Crimea, 100 bottles 
of anti-cholera medicine and 100 boxes of pills. Now that suggests to me, she had a little bit of a cottage industry going there. It wasn't just, oh, I'll make you something quickly on the side. She must have been sort of in some way producing enough to have a supply to suddenly give 100 bottles. Uh, I have found no evidence of an outlet or a business unless she sold it through other pharmacies. I just don't know how she got her medicines out there except perhaps through her patrons and the real clue to that and it's an important clue and it explains why Mary had so much support after the war from top brass military royalty and generally a lot of the aristocracy because at that time the Hahnemann homeopathic hospital had just been set up in Great Ormond Street in the 50s and there was a fashion for homeopathy in this uh, period certainly amongst the royals and the aristocracy the gentleman on the right lord rokeby was a great patron of the harneman uh he also lived just along the road from mary in upper barclay street and he was one of the leading supporters of the two funds to help mary out of debt after the war so there's an obvious connection that people who were patronizing homeopathy liked what mary was doing as well and went to her for more holistic treatments because i think also but i can't prove it to you i think she was operating as a private masseur as well because her massage techniques were very very good so we finally come to the last bit of evidence about Mary's nursing, medical career, whatever you like to call it. And that's, it shows how indomitable she was. In 1860, in 1870, when she was 65 years old, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Mary upped and wanted to volunteer to go and nurse and do her bit, just as she tried to volunteer to go to India when the Indian rebellion broke out in 57 and been turned down. Now here's the thing. She wrote a letter offering herself to Sir Harry Verney, who'd set up the British National Society for the relief of the sick and wounded in war. And they were doing a lot to send medical supplies and help to the French side of the war. They weren't supporting the, the, the German side, the Prussian side. And guess what sir harry verney of course to whom she addressed her very generous offer of help was married to parthenope nightingale the sister of florence and he asked florence for her advice on mary's gallant offer of help and florence pretty much put the kibosh on it to put it bluntly and so that didn't happen but mary is undaunted she spent several weeks down in southampton helping uh, gather up supplies of old linen and bandages to send out. So she still did her bit. So in conclusion, it's t as you can see, it's very hard to sum up Mary as a practitioner. There she is on the left in pharmacist mode, very modestly with her pestle and mortar, grinding up her potions. And there she is on the right, on the front of her memoir with her satchel full of bandages, ready to go up to the observation point at Cathcart's Hill and do kind of first aid to any wounded being brought back. She was so hands-on in everything she did, very practical, um, a bedside, she had a wonderful bedside manner. She was in every sense of the word a caregiver and a nurse in the broader sense of a woman of compassion who cared about the sick and the dying. And I think in our posthumous over-eagerness to commemorate and applaud her, there's sometimes been a danger of overemphasizing what Mary did, because we have to remind ourselves she wasn't a trailblazer in terms of nursing training, nursing, me nursing methods. Unlike Florence, she didn't write nursing manuals. She wasn't involved in anything to do with the training of nursing after the Crimean War. And she never made any outlandish claims about her methods and her own successes. At all times, Mary emphasized the fundamental instinct behind her work, which was always to offer care, comfort, support to the sick. 
And that's how I see her. I see her as the archetypal Good Samaritan. And as one of the soldiers in Crimea said it best, she was a good mother, doctor, and nurse to all. And I commend her to you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for such a, a great, a great talk tonight. And um, reading the book and listening tonight, it's opened my eyes to um, both practice, well, disease practice, and uh, the role of uh, Mrs. Seacole in, uh, particularly in the Crimea as well, well as back in Jamaica.